our study. Welcome to uh, our Bible class. I want you to know that we are excited that you are studying with us. Please note that um, for those who are tuning in for the first time, we are in the book of the Revelation of John, the book of Revelation. Um, uh, we have been starting, we started in chapter 1, and we are working our way through this book, this great book, powerful book. And so we are, decide, we are excited um, to be sharing the word with you. We thank you for those near and far. We thank the Liberty City, the city, uh, the members of the city here um, for, for their faithful um, diligence in studying the word. So just want to say um, God is so good that, that he has allowed us to have this avenue of uh, media so that we can share the word of God with you. Uh, those on our prayer list, uh, we have several, but um, many on our prayer list that, that we ask you continue to pray for, continue to just keep uh, those who are sick uh, lifted up in prayer, those who um, are going through uh, various trials, that you lift them up in prayer, um, that we keep each other built up uh, in the Lord. Come with me to Revelation chapter 10 and let's read what John says in Revelation chapter 10 and then we'll do a, a brief re review. Notice in Revelation chapter 10, John says, I saw a strong, another strong angel coming down out of heaven, clothed with a cloud. And the rainbow was upon his head and his face was like the sun and his feet like pillars of fire. And he had in his hand a little book which was open and he placed his right foot on the sea and his left on the land. He cried out with a loud voice as when a lion roars and when he had cried out, the seven peals of thunder uttered their voice. When the seven peals of thunder had spoken, I was about to write and I heard a voice from heaven saying, seal up the things which the seven peals of thunder have spoken do not write them, uh, and do not write them. Then the angel whom I saw standing on the right, uh, standing on the sea and on the uh, land, lifted up his right hand toward heaven, and swore with by him who lives forever, who created the heaven and the things in it, the earth and the things in it, and the sea and the things in it, that were that there will be no delay. But in the days of the voice of the uh, seventh angel, when he is about to sound, then the mystery of God is finished, as he preached to his servants the prophets. Uh, then the voice which I heard from heaven, I heard again speaking with me, saying, Go take the book which is open in the hand of the angel who stands on the sea and on the land. So I went to the angel, telling him to give me a, the little book, and he said to me, Take it and eat it, and it will make your stomach bitter, but in your mouth it will be sweet as honey. I took the little book out of the angel's hand, and I ate it, and in my mouth it was sweet as honey, and when I had eaten it, my stomach was made bitter. And they said to me, You must prophesy again concerning many peoples, nations, <coughs> excuse me, tongues, and kings. Thus concluding the reading of Revelation chapter 10. And here's our lesson aim. Our lesson aim is to see that the world cannot, uh, the world cannot touch what is holy unto God. And that God knows and protects his people. God's preach word and his people will ultimately be victorious. That's the lesson aim. To know that God's people always win. In a nutshell, God's people always win. And to know God's word, there isn't anything that has the power and the ability to stop God's word from going forth into the ears of mankind. And so John is letting us know that this is a picture of vindication. This is a picture of victory. And that's what the book is about. The book is about a God who sits on the throne, a God and a, and a lamb who has been risen, who now holds the destiny of God's people, the church, in his hand and will determine and declare 
what the fate of the enemies of God will in fact be. Now, let's review. In chapter 4, that throne scene is what John saw. He saw that throne where God was sitting on the throne. Mm -hmm. That was important for the first century church because with the persecution that they were facing and enduring and going through at that time, they needed to know God hadn't forgotten them. They needed to know he is on the throne. They see in chapter 5, John does, the lamb who was slain and now is risen, alive forevermore. That lamb, he says, now has walked over to him who sits on the throne and he has taken out of his hand the book that was in the one who sits on the throne. That's God the Father. If you didn't know, he takes the book out of God's hand and he begins to loosen or break the seals thereof. And you remember that as he breaks those seals, something takes place. He begins to unfold. Each seal will reveal another picture. And what do we see? We see the uh, the four horsemen, the one on the white rider, uh, signifying one who conquers. We see uh, the black horse, the red horse, the pale horse. So we've got we've got famine in the black horse, red horse. We've got war and bloodshed. Uh, uh, the pale horse, we have death. We see all of this. Uh, and 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 we know that the, after the, the aftermath of these <coughs> four horsemen, what takes place in verse nine and ten of chapter six? You see the the, the martyr, the martyrs of those who gave their life to the Lord. We see them now under John sees them under the altar. They're crying out, "How long, O Lord, before you avenge our blood?" So. What took place after the, the destruction of these four horsemen? It was the death of those who had given their life to the Lord. And then what we see in chapter 7, John gives us another vivid picture. In chapter 7, he gives us, he strengthens our hope. Because in chapter 7, he says we have been sealed by God. Yeah, we are protected, we are kept. That seal in the Holy Spirit in this context. The seal there is a is a sealing, a divine protection of God. You know this isn't he isn't talking about the Holy Spirit because they already have the Holy Spirit. They aren't sealed to gain the Holy Spirit. They are sealed because they have the Holy Spirit. They are sealed by God for the express purpose of being protected from the enemy. Chapter 8 and chapter 9, the warning judgments come. Those trumpets begin to sound. Uh, and we see some things happening. And all of this takes place, friends, after we see the prayers of the saints in chapter 6 going up before the throne room of God. God acts on behalf of the prayers of his saints. So in chapter nine, in, uh, 8 and 9, this judgment is imminent. That, well, the judgment is now uh, at hand. And so we get to uh, chapter 10 and what John sees in chapter 10 is an angel of vindication, the strong, powerful, and mighty angel of vindication. Notice, let's read it again. John says, I saw another strong angel coming down out of heaven, clothed with a cloud, and the rainbow was upon his head and his face was like the sun, his feet like pillars of fire. Now notice, John says, this angel that I saw was a very powerful angel. And he comes, his garments are the garments of the clouds. And usually when it talks about God coming on the cloud or the Lord coming on the cloud or riding on the cloud, it speaks of divine judgment upon a nation. So John says, this angel is his garment is that of the cloud. Now notice, he says uh, he is also <coughs> he has upon his head a rainbow. Now you saw this church in chapter four and verse three. We see the uh, when God is sitting on the throne. John says around the throne is the rainbow. He sees the color of emerald. He sees this rainbow which signifies 
a covenant keeping God. So now what John is saying in chapter 10 is that this angel who is sent by God, he has the authority of God. He also has upon his head a rainbow, which would have told the first century church who would have read this book. They would have been reminded that God keeps covenant. We, they would have been reminded that God has sealed them. And we know they're sealed because he's the covenant-keeping God. He's the covenant-making God. He's the covenant-initiating God. And he is the covenant-keeping God. And we need to know that even in the 21st century. Those living as children of God today, we need to be reminded that God keeps covenant. God will not fail. God is faithful. God is just. And God is loving gracious enough and merciful enough to keep covenant with his children. I love that church. I love that when things get tough in our life, when things get tough in my life, I know for a fact God will not break his covenant. God will not go back on his covenant. He will keep covenant. John says this angel has this rainbow of covenant about his head. His face was like the sun and his feet like pillars of fire. It's it's symbol is uh, similar to the uh, the picture that John gave about Jesus when he talks about Jesus' hair being like wool and his feet like bronze and his eyes like fire. But now I need you to know, just like I explained to you in chapter one, when John gives that description, he is not talking about Jesus' skin color. When he talks about hair like wool, and he talks about he talks about righteousness, white like wool. He talks about uh, the purity of Jesus. He talks about the righteous judgment of Jesus. He's speaking of his character. Then he speaks of his feet like bronze, not a skin color. And I and I and I hear many uh, today who would suggest that this is a picture of Jesus' skin color. And they talk about his hair being like wool, and they talk white like wool, and they talk about his feet like bronze, but they never ever elaborate on his eyes being like fire. No man, white or black, has eyes like fire. No man. The eyes like fire signify, this is highly figurative and uh, uh, symbolic language. So the eyes like fire are the penetrating, uh, the omniscience, I mean, the, um, yeah, the omniscience of Jesus, the omnipresence of Jesus. He knows all. He sees all. When you read the, the letter he wrote to the seven churches of Asia, he would always tell them, I know. I know your works. I know your heart. I know what you do. I know, I know, I know, which means Jesus is telling them, I see everything. I have. I am aware of what you're dealing with, aware of what you're going through. And just remember, because I know all, I see all, I am a covenant-keeping God. I am a merciful God, and I, and I have sealed you, by the way. So I'm going to make good on what I promised to you. The other thing that John says, that, that, well, let me just elaborate a little further. That's why you know you have to be careful at a giving a literal interpretation of this book all the way through. Notice something. The angel, he says, this angel has a rainbow about his head. His face is like the sun. Not his face is the sun. His face is like the sun and his feet like pillars of fire. Notice, church, like pillars of fire. So now, if the if the description that John gives about Jesus in chapter one is literal, well, then so is it for the angel. It it has to also be literal. John is not trying to convey to us a literal description of what the angel looked like, or and should I say, and and what Jesus looks like. He's speaking to his power, his his ability, his character, what he is able to accomplish, his authority. Watch this. He had in his hand a little book, which was open. He placed his right foot on the sea, his left on the land, signifying his the universality 
of his authority, as well as you can even say his power. That's what it's saying. I got one foot here, one foot there. I am everywhere. I see all. I know all. I am present everywhere. You can't escape me or elude me. He says, At this angel who has been given the authority of God to carry out the judgment of God, he says, this angel's judgment, uh, the judgment that he will carry out is universal. Watch this, church. Oh, watch this. He says, he cried with a loud voice as when a lion roars, and when he had cried out, the seven pearls of thunder uttered their voices, peals of thunder, should I say, uttered their voices, those peals of thunder. That signifies judgment is at hand. Matter of fact, reference this church, when he talks about his, his voice roaring like a lion, that signifies judgment. You'll find that in Joel chapter 3, verse 16, and Amos chapter 1, verse 2. He then says, he says, uh, then the angel whom I saw standing. Well, let me back up. Verse, verse 4 says, when the seven peals of thunder had spoken, I, I was about to write. Verse 4, look at this, church. He says, when, I, when the seven peals of thunder had spoken, I was about to write. I heard a voice from heaven saying, seal up the things which the seven peals of thunder have spoken, and do not write them. You remember earlier, John was told not to seal up the things written in the book. In other words, don't seal it up because judgment is at hand, or as is as, as nigh. Seal up the book. Now John says, seal it up. Or John is told to seal up the book. Why? Because there will be no more warning. I will not delay, God is saying, my judgment. So when he says seal it up, he's saying, listen, I've given them time. I've given them opportunity to repent. I've given them chance to come to themselves and to come to me. I've done that. I have been merciful. I have been patient. Yet they rebel against me. Seal up the book. Church, you got to understand, we must never take lightly the grace and mercy of God. When God give you are here by the mercy of God, the graciousness of God. You, you are still, God didn't wipe you out because of his mercy. The stuff that you used to do, the stuff, the way you used to think, the stuff you used to say, and the stuff you still do. God has been so gracious and merciful that he did not wipe us out. And he says, to, but he says, there is a day coming when God will seal up the book. There will be no more warning. Think about that. Jesus says that the second coming will be like a thief in the night. So whenever God uh, declares in heaven to seal up the, the things of the, the affairs of this world, seal it up, time will be no more. And no man will ever have the ex be able to use the excuse he didn't have time. No man will ever be able to have the excuse that he didn't, um, he didn't have the opportunity to obey the Lord. God will say, seal it up. That's a lesson for us as children of God. That you listen, God's grace is runs deeper than sin. I need to say that. God's grace runs deep. Sin cannot outrun or outdo God's grace. However, be careful that you don't, you don't live a life, and you'll see this with Israel in a minute, that you don't live a life so rebellious to God, so nonchalant with God, uh, that God pulls the curtain on your life and says, seal up the book. That's why we got to make sure we take every opportunity to give God glory, to give him praise and to tell others about the good news of Jesus. Yeah, that's important, my friends. That's important. He, 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 he gives this description. This is a powerful angel. And he tells John, though, John, your responsibility, seal up the book. He, uh, 
And now notice verse 5. Then the angel whom I saw standing on the sea and on the, on the land lifted up his hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever, who created heaven, things in it, created the earth, the things in it, created the sea, the things in it, that there will be delay no longer. In other words, God who has, who has been the creator of this universe, God who is the sustainer of this universe, God who has all authority, God who is greater than the Roman Empire, he says that same God has given the decree that there will be delay concerning his judgment no longer. Watch this. He says, but in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he is about to sound, then the mystery <coughs> of God is finished as he preached to his servants, the prophets. Then the voice which I heard from heaven, I heard again speaking with me saying, go take the book which is open in the hand of the angel who stands on the sea and on the land. So now John is given a uh, and in some instruction. He says, go to the angel and take the book out of his hand. And what I want you to do, John, I want you to eat the book. Look at what he says to him. He says, so I went to the angel telling him to give me the little book. He said to me, take it, eat it. It will make your stomach bitter, but in your mouth, it will be sweet as honey. What do we have, church? Just like he gives the description of Jesus in chapter one that the church needed to hear. He gives a description of this angel, feet like fire, Jesus having feet like bronze. Um, in other words, that's the destructive power and, uh, and ability of Jesus and this angel. He's, they needed to know that because the enemy at that moment looked greater than God. The persecution was so severe that the Roman Empire looked as if they were... Uh, uh, indestructible, that nothing could penetrate, nothing could bring them down. They needed to know Jesus is like uh, polished bronze. This angel has feet like fire, right? That will destroy any enemy that stands in opposition to the people of God. He says they, they needed to know, they needed to know. But John then says something else, because this is this, this chapter 10 is about the judgment of God the vindication of his people. Then he says, now John, what I want you to do, I want you to go get the book. Eat the book. <laughs> Eat the book, John. And then go tell him. Yeah, Eat e the book, John. Take what I'm giving you as my New Testament prophet. Take my word and go preach it. Let me tell you, church, Nothing, no, no job occupation, no profession, no position in this world is greater than the man of God who preaches the word of God. You cannot and you must not take lightly uh, who he is. He is sent to you by God. He speaks on behalf of God and his divine calling is to eat the book and go tell it. Church, so when you listen to the word of God preach, God is speaking through the man who he has sent to you in order for you to hear. Now let's come to Ezekiel chapter 2. Because what John does in, in chapter 10 is he echoes Ezekiel chapter 2. Yeah, yeah. He echoes an Old Testament passage. Now I need us to get there quickly. In Ezekiel chapter, let me get there first. In Ezekiel chapter 2, I want you to notice. He says, this is what God says to Ezekiel. He said to me, son of man, stand on your feet that I may speak with you. As he spoke with me, the spirit entered me and set me on my feet, and I heard him speaking with, to me. Then he said, son of man, I am sending you to the sons of Israel. Watch this, church. I'm sending you to the sons of Israel. Right? To do what? Mm -hmm. To, uh, well, let me first, not to do what, we got to get to the description of the people. He says, I'm sending you to the sons of Israel, children of Israel. Who are they, Lord? How do you, look at how God describes them. A rebellious people who have rebelled against me. 
they and their fathers have transgressed against me to this very day. I'm sending you to them who are stubborn and obstinate. You shall say to them, thus says the Lord. Now notice, Ezekiel isn't saying, he isn't making up what to say. He is saying what thus says the Lord. He is telling, he is to tell Israel what God has given him to tell. He says to them, he says to Ezekiel, go say to them, as for them, they will not listen. For they are a rebellious house. They will know that a prophet, and they will know that a prophet has been among them. God says, what I give you, the man of God, to preach the word, my word, he says, no man will ever be able to say, I didn't sin a preacher. No man will not will, will ever be able to say, I didn't hear the word. God will raise up men everywhere to preach the word. He says, but you guess, look at who he's going to preach to. A rebellious people, obstinate people, people who just shake a rebellious fist at God. John, God says, Ezekiel, go preach to him. Now watch this, and you, verse 6, son of man, neither fear them nor their words, though thistles and thorns are with you, and you sit on scorpions, neither fear their words nor be dismayed at their presence, for they are a rebellious house, but you shall speak my words to them whether they listen or not, for they are rebellious. You keep seeing the redundancy in that? They are rebellious people. Now you, son of man, listen to what I am speaking to you. Do not be rebellious like that rebellious house. Open your mouth and eat what I'm saying. Then I looked and behold, a, a hand was extended me a, and lo, a scroll was in it. And when he spread it out before me, it was written on the front of the book. And whoa, what? Now John is going to later show that eating, this, eating the words of God, eating this great book, is going to make him bitter. It's going to be bitter as it comes back up. Now, now, now he he says, and in this, that what makes it bitter? That I've got to tell you that judgment is coming. That i got to tell you that the book has been sealed up. John said, that's not easy to do. That's not, that's not the most pleasant thing to do. But we got to preach it. We have to tell people what this say, what thus says the Lord and not what they want to hear. We've got to tell it like it is. We've got to uh, not shun to declare the whole counsel of God. But then by God, make sure when we tell folk about the judgment of God, make sure we give them hope. Make sure we tell them, but there's good news. Jesus died for people like you like me. He died for his church. That's the whole church. But now notice verse, chapter 3, verse 1. He says, he said to me, son of man, eat what you find. Eat this scroll and go and speak to the house of Israel. So I opened my mouth and he fed me the scroll. He said to me, son of man, feed your stomach and fill your body with this scroll, which I am giving you. Then I ate it and it was sweet as honey in my mouth. Look at that. Sweet as honey in my mouth. Church, I think that's good enough for, for that particular uh, passage. When you, you get home, read all of chapter 2. It will bless you. John is commissioned to do the same thing. Eat the book. Eat what I give you because it's going to be sweet while in your mouth, but it'll be bitter when it has to come back out. But you got to preach it. He says, so I went to the angel telling him to give me the book. Take it, eat it. It will make your stomach bitter. But in your mouth it will be sweet as honey. I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it. And in and in my mouth it was sweet as honey. And when I had eaten it, my stomach was made bitter. They said again to me, you must prophesy again concerning many people, nation, tongues, and kings. He says, listen, they won't hear you. Some of them won't listen. Uh, but your job is to preach it. Your job is to teach it. Your job is to tell story of God. That's what he wants for us, friends. Tell the story of God. What a blessing, what a blessing. I'm going to pause there. We're going to save, uh, we're, going to, we're, going to, we're going to go into chapter 11 in our next study. But I, I want you to be mindful that 
God will vindicate his people. Our faith operates from a standpoint, a position of victory. And then we need to know, we need to know that God will not allow the evil and the wicked to go unpunished. God will not allow it. He, his character can't, won't allow it. And so we need to be mindful of that. We need to be mindful that God, when we stay faithful to the Lord, God will vindicate us. Yeah, when we stay committed to him, we need to know that there is a time that will run out with God and God will say, seal up the book. I pray that this study has blessed you. I pray that you have gained uh, some insights from it. And I pray that you will continue to grow in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Join me in prayer. Father God, I thank you for your grace and your mercy. I thank you, Father, for the power of of your word. I thank you, dear God, for allowing us to be here uh, to study your word. I thank you, Father, for allowing us to, um, to give you glory. I pray, Heavenly Father, that you will continue to uh, draw us closer to you. Father, build our faith, build our trust in you. Father, we pray that you, uh, you will continue to bless uh, many who are sick and uh, not with us. Many who are who have been afflicted um, as long as since this pandemic, Father. We pray for our young people, for first responders, Father. Watch over their health and keep them safe and sound. Father, we just give you glory. We thank you for it all. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you.